lovely people, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Sammy and I'm a writer who likes to learn about writing through reading and share what I learn with you. This week, I wanna to talk to you about The Games Gods Play by Abigail Owen. Owen? Yeah, Abigail Owen. I didn't know if it was with an S or not because um, my sticker from Sam's Club is still on this book. I fully grabbed this because A, it was at Sam's Club and I was at Sam's Club and I walked by their books and it was super pretty. That was almost the entire reason. And I'm generally not like fully influenced by a book cover being pretty, but I was this time. Sprayed edges are cute. Sprayed edges are cute. And it's just like a little bit damaged because it's from, it's the, it's the discount version from Sam's Club. Uh, so, you know, that's life. I am one for a book reject. I didn't realize until I was already like probably three quarters of the way through that this is a red tower book, which I had been avoiding because I was under the impression that they crank out really, really bad books. However, Abigail Owen has a lot of books that are on my want to read list. I've been drawn to a lot of her books concepts and I assume, I think this is her first Red Tower book that has been published, at least since Red Tower books has had that like realm of bad book content. I had fun reading this book. There is a lot of things that I can say about it though. So let's get into a quick summary so we know what we're talking about today. Lyra Kiris was cursed at birth by Zeus to never be able to be loved. After being sold off into the Order of Thieves by her indifferent parents at the age of three, she's now finally hit her breaking point and is ready to face off with Zeus himself and get the curse off her or die trying. As she prepares to deface the temple of Zeus, she meets Hades, who is instantly intrigued by her. The Olympian gods have a crucible every 100 years where they have mortal champions fight on their behalf to become king or queen of the gods, specifically the Olympian gods there. This is the first time that Hades has competed and he chooses Lyra as his champion. So let's get into my thoughts right quick. I think this world is so interesting. The concept of being in a space where things are relatively similar to the world that we live in right now, but every god or deity or pantheon is real. And you can just choose what religion you want to dedicate yourself to or not based on your needs or like perspectives or history or whatever is going on is super interesting. And I think it creates a lot of questions for this society that don't necessarily need to get answered because we are centered in the Olympian gods for this story. But there is like a moment where Lyra's like, I'm changing pantheons after this. And I'm like, that's such a wild concept that A, all of these religions are real and tangible. So how does that affect like Christians who believe that there is only one God? And then there are like, so many other gods. Like, what does that do to their religion? So interesting. Such an interesting concept to like the immediacy with how interested and intrigued I was with the world and then letting that bleed into my interest in Lyra as a character and a narrator was well done and extremely well established. Lyra is so funny. Like the way that she narrates, the way that she perceives the world, the way that she talks to literal actual gods is so funny and entertaining that it makes these like god level stakes more manageable and tolerable. And it's very, it's very fun. It's just like fun in general, a good time. I also think that the method of creating the like romantic tension in the book makes it feel like it's taking a lot longer to get through and develop this relationship and makes it not feel like an insta-love because it takes a long time as a reader to get through to different landmarks of a relationship. Even though I think the entire book takes place over like a month, maybe two. It's hard to say because like time isn't really super important because they are in Olympus. So it's hard to say exactly how much time has passed in this relationship for it to develop the way that it has. And it feels like 
more time has, significantly more time has elapsed. I think that that's really important if you're going to have a story that can read as an insta-love for me as a reader, because I hate it when it's just like instantaneous and like very fast and it feels very fast. But if you can build that momentum that time creates in real life into your book, then I think that's a really effective way of navigating that like insta-love vibe. There are definitely a lot of other readers that will think that this is an insta-love because it is by like every definition of what that means. There is not physically enough time for the romance to develop in the way that it does. The fact that it doesn't feel as unsettling as a lot of other romances that take place in the same amount of time is what I'm highlighting. It's definitely an insta-love still, it just doesn't feel as tangibly like one. I think that because Lyra's incapable of being loved and she's aware that she has this curse on her makes it have a very interesting commentary on what friendship means and what like being an ally means and how that can affect what happens if there is trust but there you know that there's no way that somebody can care about you or what happens if you know that somebody might like to be around you but also can't love you. How does that affect the relationship and what the relationship means to you and to the like grand scheme of your existence and what knowing that people can't love you or care about you in that capacity will do to your attempts at making connections with other people? Because I think that's a great commentary on something that a lot of people can experience just from like a mental health perspective of things that you can feel like you're unlovable. You can feel like nobody's going to ever care about you. You can feel like you don't deserve those things. And because you feel like that internally, being cursed by Zeus or just having bad mentality, mental space, doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to limit your potential to make connections. But by knowing that you have a potential like end point, it can lead your mentality to stopping you from continuing. So I think that in a way, it's a really interesting like dodging a mental health situation by placing it into the hands of literal gods, rather than having it be something that like, maybe you had a bad childhood, or maybe you got bullied a little too much as a child, and that like is internalized in you. And it can highlight that there are different levels of relationships and the fact that you might not feel like you can reach the highest level of relationship doesn't mean that you don't deserve any relationship. And I think that that's super interesting in the way that it was done because it's set up in this very like black and white way at the beginning of the story where Lyra's like, nobody can care about me. But that doesn't mean that nobody knows that you're around right? They might not be able to care about you as an individual, but maybe they care about the impact that you are able to have on like the community space or something like that. And it's so black and white at the start. And then gradually you start to see all of these different shades of gray in the middle. And it's so well established that you like think about it afterwards. You think about what the true meaning of friendship is. And it's like so powerful. There were a lot of really small details that happened in this book, like just small moments that left me feeling like warm and fuzzy inside for lack of a better term. There were a lot of just small things that I don't think warrant being discussed each individually because I think that would take away from the reading experience for other people. But I do just think that there were a lot of very small moments that all culminated together into being something that I can talk about as like, there are details within this story that build up the world and shape it into this tangible, like, full heart of the story. And I really enjoyed those. On to some things that I think could be improved about this story. So the inherent structure of the Crucible is that there are generally 12 gods that are competing for this opportunity to be king or queen or ruler of the Olympian gods. And generally, those 12 gods they all have their own virtue, value. There are four people in each of the values or virtues. And then there are 12 challenges. And each of the challenges is developed and planned by each of the gods who are intending to participate. So essentially, you get introduce god, introduce challenge, big twist on challenge because 
God and mortality is a crazy concept to them. They don't care about you. And then challenge happens. And then you have to solve the challenge and get through it. And then also pay attention to where the other competitors are to see how you're doing in the challenge and where you're going to end up at the end of it. And then after the challenge, you need to recover from it. And then you have to do the next God's challenge. So it ends up being this repetitive cycle of like this thing, uh, God's introduced, here's the vibe of the, this God, and then here's what this challenge is, and then here's your big twist, and then here's how the actual competition of the thing goes, and then here's you recovering after it, and then here's the next God. So it starts to be really, really repetitive. I so stopped caring about what the God's challenges were going to be, and I feel like it's a big part of the story of what goes on in the actual challenges, because it leads to the things that happen afterwards and what mentality shifts happen and like what happens to the allies that are established in the competitors and all of these things. And by like the sixth one out of 12, I was like, man, can we get through this challenge? But at the same time, there was a lot of like tension and momentum within those scenes, but I had to get to that point where it was like, oh, 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 stress. Oh, stress, great. <sighs> okay, now for the part that I'm actually interested in. So they end up like forcing tension in the middle of the challenges that doesn't feel as important, even though it is quite literally life and death. It is a high stakes situation. It just doesn't, it isn't what's drawing me into the story anymore. And it's not what I'm like highly. Somehow my battery died while my camera was plugged in. So. It's been a few minutes because I had to let it charge. Um, I don't remember what I was saying, so I'm hoping I finished my point on that one and I'm just gonna move on to the next thing that I think can be improved. The setup to the beginning of the story and also the packaging on the book makes it seem like the mortal plane is going to be more important than it actually is during the story. Like, this is the Golden Gate Bridge, so we start off in San Francisco. That's where the Temple of Zeus is. It's in San Francisco. San Francisco is a town run by the power of Zeus's electricity. It's the only God-run city in the world, I guess. And we get so much information about the mortal plane. And then we spend like, probably, we're in Olympus for like this whole part of the book. And this is all that we have on like entirely just the mortal plane. Everything else is like the gods put the characters into the mortal plane to do their challenge and then they're brought back to Olympus. And that's not very much to have the Golden Gate Bridge as the foil on the front cover. Like it's such an interesting world, such an interesting world. We don't spend any time in it. Something that I think is neither good nor bad um, is that this book has like a comical amount of chapters. How many chapters does it have? That's an epilogue. It has 111 chapters. The last chapter is a chapter 111 and, and then there's an epilogue which would make it 112 chapters. Um, Cause I don't think there's a prologue. Yeah. There's a preface, which is just like a paragraph. So I'm not counting that as a chapter. There's 112 chapters in the book and they're all very like quick. Uh, it's like two to seven pages-ish per chapter. And that's good or bad, depending on what kind of reader you are. I really enjoyed it because I thought it added like a momentum to the story. Every chapter ends on a cliffhanger emotionally. So you get to continue going. But I did see someone else describe that it felt like it had been intended to be a fan fiction and that's why the chapters are all so short so that it would be like a continued moving fan fiction. And that's funny to me because I also enjoy reading fan fiction. My camera's about to die again, what the heck? My camera better let me get through this, oh my goodness. Okay, so what do I think we can learn from this book? Um, don't judge a book by a cover. That one's for me because I fully spent $20 on the book because 
it was pretty and I could have gotten the ebook and I would have been fine and probably faster at reading it. But you know, that's life. That is life sometimes. I also think you can learn that you should flesh out the world to the capacity that you think the story will need and remove stuff that might not be important to your readers with where the story is actually going. Because I have a lot of world questions that I do not think at any point in the story I will get an answer to because of how this book ends. Um, but I have a lot of questions about the world and I saw that a lot of other people in the review space were also upset or confused, more so confused about the Golden Gate Bridge being a major factor in the visual aspects of the book. So just know what is important to your readers and don't be afraid of pulling things out later on that don't come back in. Consider your pacing when it comes to doing a repetitive type of story. How can you make the repetition feel like it's not constantly doing the same thing? How can you make it feel very different emotionally? That's something that like having these multiple challenges or like a school setting, a lot of things start to feel repetitive and you need things to break it up. This book actually does that later on, but I don't want to spoil it. So I'm just saying like it found a way to break the monotony. I just started to feel it a little bit sooner than I think it was intended for me to feel it. You can also learn that character voice will be hit or miss if you have a really strong and confident, settled in themselves character. Some people are either gonna love how your character talks. I loved how Lyra was. Some people may hate her because she's lowering these like high level stakes away from what they should be for these god challenges and things, but I thought it made it 10 times better. So having the confidence to really stick your character's voice together and have it be a solid placement of what this character actually is and stands for, I think is going to automatically make your story feel more complete and consistent and give it some ground to stand on. If you're gonna do something interesting with your character voice and somebody doesn't like it, that's fine. That's life. It's gonna be hit or miss for every reader. Hopefully it's more hit than it is miss, but commit and be consistent with it. And I think that there will be some pretty common results. That is all that I've got for you today. I will see you guys next week. I am starting to work on my Preptober content. So we will see you with that next week and uh, get into our 50 words in, uh, <laughs> 50 words is not very many. Uh, we'll get into our 50,000 word writing challenge. So I will see you guys next time. Lyra Curies was cursed at birth. Lyra Curies was birth, was birthed at curse. Lyra Curies was cursed Lyra Curies was cursed at birth. Fuck. Why is that so difficult to say? The Olympian gods have a crucible of... Oh, fuck. I promise it's not hard.